Tuesday morning was my first day back at work after having a long weekend away with my wife. And perhaps like some of you, I turned on the radio and was not surprised um, and yet incredibly frustrated to hear about the latest bit of proposed immigration policy that the administration has put forth. Perhaps you have heard a little bit about it. The idea is a kind of um, means testing for people attempting to uh, legally uh, immigrate to this country. Um, a sense of, uh, really it seems to be a sense of wanting to uh, punish immigrants who take advantage of the opportunities that they are legally entitled to, opportunities that are social safety net has um, enshrined for uh, human dignity for all persons, food stamps and Medicaid and the like. And all week I heard people from the administration defending this policy and uh, talking about how it surely wasn't directed at any particular group, heard about how it surely wasn't intended to punish poor people. Rather, that the purpose of this legislation was to ensure that people wanting to live in this country were capable of standing on their own two feet. Over and over again, I heard those two words, maybe one word hyphenated, self-sufficiency. Now, I think reasonable people can disagree about what is wise and humane immigration policy. Certainly, reasonable countries take different approaches to how to handle such things. But I'm here as a priest in the Church of God to say to you that self-sufficiency is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wasn't surprised that we had a reading this week that uh, would provide opportunities to reflect on this policy and would provide opportunities to uh, reflect on the uh, profound ways that God is always calling us into human community, into interdependence, into mutual vulnerability, mutual service. Uh, so I want to spend a little time with this reading from the letter to the Hebrews that we heard the end of the passage of this morning. Uh, you may remember that it began last week, and there's a big section in the middle that the lectionary has cut out. But it is a kind of history or uh, genealogy or uh, sacred celebration of the faith of the people of God over uh, generation after generation after generation. Again and again we hear from the author of this letter about the uh, temptations and trials and victories uh, won by faith uh, through, uh, won by faith by the, uh, by the people of and that emphasis on faith it just comes like a, like a chorus all the way through this kind of obscenely long list of, uh, of persons. I love the way that we hear um, that there wouldn't be time. Let me take a little more time and list a few more of them for you. Again and again, I hear that notion um, by faith. So already there is built into this understanding a sense at the very least of the uh, lack of self-sufficiency that is part of the faithful life. Again and again, we see that the persons in this great long list are putting their trust in God and not in themselves. But I think that um, the way that this reading culminates is actually even more profound than that, and that we're being called to about the ways that human community and interdependence are an essential part of this experience of faith as well. There's lots of names we can pluck from this very
very, very long list uh, to explore that idea in more detail. Um, I found myself uh, wanting to think a bit about Moses, who is mentioned just before the part of the reading that we hear this morning. Moses, who, of course, uh, finds himself uh, as a baby dependent on adoptive parents, um, precisely because, interestingly enough, of a policy aimed to punish immigrants and uh, attempting to um, uh, contain uh, a, a, a culture who has arrived in, uh, in a foreign land. Moses, who, when he finds himself then estranged later uh, from, uh, from his home where he's grown up in Egypt, is dependent on the people that he meets in the wilderness, Moses, who is dependent on Aaron to do the very work that God has called him to do, um, God gives him this partner in this ministry. And Moses, who is one of my absolute favorite passages of scripture, one that is an uh, echo of a second story, as if to really um, make the point, Moses, who is told by his father-in-law when he witnesses him sitting in judgment over the all day long. Moses was told by Jethro, surely you will wear yourself out. Surely you should be sharing this ministry of leadership and prophecy and judgment with a community of others who you entrust to bring the important cases to you and otherwise entrust to uh, take care of the business that uh, you have decided to share with them. So even this singular prophet, Moses, has, I think, um, at every phase in his life, uh, this profound connection to uh, the people around him uh, flies in the face of any sort of notion of self-sufficiency. And then, of course, part of the power of this passage is the way that it builds and it builds and and finally turns our eyes to Jesus, to the author and uh, perfecter of our faith, as the reading puts it. And um, it's worth reminding ourselves um, again and again that the Son of God lived his life in such a way that he was constantly depending on the generosity of others called his disciples to live their lives in a way that was constantly depending on the generosity of others. These tradespeople, carpenters, fishermen, they go out into uh, their mission field and they depend on the food and the shelter and the hospitality and the welcome and love of the people that they meet when they are sent out. And Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, directs the community of followers after his death and resurrection to uh, build a way of living together that is similarly concerned with caring for all those who are in need, caring precisely for those who have been forgotten, caring precisely for those who have been marginalized by the cultural mores of today would otherwise have no chance at self-sufficiency. And yet I think it goes even a little bit deeper than that. As I said, this reading builds and it builds and it builds, and we get this image, this image that I find quite inspiring, of this great cloud of witnesses. We are invited to picture all of these heroes of faith um, surrounding us, cheering us on. Um, if you've ever run a race, maybe in an urban setting, uh, the kinds of races that sometimes make it difficult to get to church, uh, it's so powerful to have people lining the streets, cheering you on. This image of the cloud of witnesses is, um, I find, quite moving and quite inspiring. And yet notice what the author of this letter says to his audience. 
We hear this phrase that, yes, these heroes of faith were commended for their faith. And yet, something of their destiny, something of all of our destiny, this destiny to be gathered in by the God who is longing to transform our lives and transform us even beyond death, whether you use words like deliverance or salvation or transformation, whatever words and language we use, it seems to me that in this reading, the author is saying, even that great cloud of witnesses isn't done yet. Without us, no perfection. It's a profound, profound notion. Without us, without you and I, without the author of this letter, without us, no perfection. We are all in this race together. The boundaries between the runners and the spectators, the boundaries between the heroes of the faith and we everyday disciples, those boundaries get erased. And we find that we are all being drawn in cheered on, perfected, nudged, pushed, strengthened, sanctified, able to persevere for another day. We are all in that together. And Jesus, this author and perfecter of our faith, is there at the center of the cloud, urging us on. It has been a hard couple of years for people who live on the margins. It has been a hard couple of years for people who seek to stand in solidarity with people on the margins. It's easy to hear news reports day after day after day and to despair. But I think passages like this one the witness of the faithful throughout generations tells us that we have been given a life and given a faith that we should not expect to be easy, but we should not expect to have to go it alone. So in the days ahead, I invite you to imagine yourself in different places in this race. Imagine yourself as part of the cloud. Imagine yourself as one of the runners. Imagine the many ways that Jesus and the community of faith are cheering you on. Draw from it the strength to persevere. Draw from it the strength to be in solidarity with those who are being targeted. And draw from it 